Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. With the hot, muggy weather, I thought it would be helpful to bring back an old episode on heat stress in livestock. Now, this information is for more than just our livestock owners, as heat stress happens to humans and pets. Now, this show was first aired in July of 2019. However, it has been edited to help avoid some confusion and provide more clarity in places. There is a link in the show notes to give you access to a really great publication that we used heavily in the production of this show called Livestock Heat Stress, Recognition, Response, and Prevention by Susan Kerr from Washington State University Extension. If you're not listening to the podcast version and are interested in getting a copy of it, it is online and you could send us an email and we can send you the link or you can call us at the office and we will mail you a copy. Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Karen Cox from West Virginia University Extension. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Okay, I am here to bring you a special report uh, regarding the upcoming heat wave that's going to be hitting the area. We are looking at upcoming heat indices ranging from 105 to 110 over the next couple of days. So even though this isn't when this is supposed to come out, I wanted to make sure that we got this information out to those who needed it. So if you have livestock or a fair animal, I do encourage you to listen up and take steps in advance to make sure that your animals are protected and safe during this heat. Okay, so first thing you need to know is what is a thermoneutral zone? And that's basically the temperature in the area that is most, well, that requires the least amount of effort upon the mammal to adjust their internal temperature to their comfort level. Now, for you and I, we're looking at probably somewhere in between the mid-60s to the mid-70s, and that's where a human is most happy, depending on where you're from, how much clothing you're wearing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. However, for animals, they're a little bit more restrictive. So for cattle, for instance, they're looking at a thermal neutral zone range between 41 degrees and 68 degrees, where calves, they're not quite as good for the cold. They're 50 degrees to 68 degrees. Sheep have a much wider range depending on their coat and all sorts of other things. They're actually one of our most resistant animals when it comes to temperature issues but they can range from 70 to 88 and be perfectly happy and even more variable depending. Goats are going to be between 50 and 68. So for those animals, you're looking at ranges of temperatures that seem to end in the high 60s. So we're already looking at temperatures of 85, 90. And so we're already well above that temperature range which makes our animals happiest. And, you know, these guys are going to have big, thick coats and they're going to be out in the sun all day. So you need to, as a livestock manager, make sure that you keep those animals where they need to be. And that is in the shade around a cool water source. And this is really important because if those body temperatures, if the if it gets so hot that your animals can no longer regulate their body temperature and keep themselves cool, you could be looking at even death. So it really is a serious issue. And so basically with our uh, temperature humidity index, it's where they combine the temperature with the predicted humidity. So again, we are already well above where our animals are happiest and we're reaching into the severe and extreme range of potential heat stress problems. You know, your animals may be struggling and this is especially true for dairy animals. Uh, They really do have a very low temperature that they can tolerate. And you're going to see milk production loss even when it's just above 68 degrees. 
So definitely trying to take steps to keep animals cool. And so the different ways that animals can cool is, of course, like you and I, they can sweat. And you say you have a little bit of heat loss by evaporation of water from the, from the skin, exhaled breath. So that's why you start to see them breathe a little faster. Uh, sometimes they'll open their mouth to, to breathe and that exhales even more heat uh, from their body. You can also have heat loss by air movement, moving the hot air away from the surface of the animal. And also you can have the radiant heat loss just for when the environment cools down. So this is really an issue when it comes to the summertime and the nights are staying warm. So the biggest issue we have right now is the nights aren't dropping below 70 degrees. And so we're keeping that heat stress on the animal for an extended period of time. Another thing that animals can do to help cool their body is called vasodilation. And basically that is when your blood or when the animal's blood cells swell so that they can carry more heat and they come up to the surface of the skin where the heat can be lost to the moving air over top of it. And that is another way. But all of these things take energy for the animal to do. So your animals do burn more energy. And once it gets to a certain point, the energy used and the heat made by using that energy can actually increase the temperature of the animal. So as they're trying to cool themselves, they can't because the amount of energy they're expending to cool themselves is actually causing them to heat up even more. So that's really when a livestock owner or a human needs to come in and help them out. And this isn't just livestock. This is your pets. This is your, yourself too. All right, so let's start with the signs of heat stress. The signs of heat stress include crowding around your water tanks or any shade that's available, the lower social order animals getting pushed out of the shade, lethargy, a poor appetite, increased respiratory rate where they're just breathing really fast, an elevated rectal temperature, elevated heart rate, immobility or aimless wandering. If they're staggering, drooling or slobbering, they're foamy at the mouth, open mouth breathing, especially when you start seeing collapse, non-responsiveness, seizures, and unfortunately, sometimes death occurs as well. So none of us want that. So one of the first things you can do is start to try and measure the respiratory rate of the animals. This really is the most practical and effective way to find out if your animals are suffering from heat stress. All you need to do is watch them. What you're looking at is for the resting respiratory rate. So this is an animal who's happy and comfortable. Beef cattle, you're looking at probably 26 to 50 breaths per minute. Whereas if you have dairy cattle, you're looking at 26 to 50 breaths per minute. Goats will be 10 to 30 breaths per minute. And a horse, you're looking at 10 to 14. For pigs, they're a little faster, and it's 32 to 58 breaths per minute. So you can see where this is very species specific. In sheep, you're looking at 16 to 34 breaths per minute. So you can find all of this information online, but I'm just trying to get it to you in a quick, easy to digest format here. Watch them, uh, count for a minute, you know, set your timer on your watch or your phone for one minute and count the number of breaths you can see the animal take. When an animal is suffering from heat stress, their breaths are going to be even deeper and you'll be more obvious. So a cow that's breathing in, in a normal temperature zone, you're not really going to notice their breathing too much. But when they start to show signs of heat stress, you'll see them They'll stretch their neck out, they'll open their mouth, and you'll really be able to see the breath coming in and out of the chest of that animal. So when you're getting to uh, dangerous uh, respiratory rates or symptoms of heat stress, and now I'm going to stick with just cattle and sheep for this, but you can start to see where the pattern goes. So if they have a low degree of heat stress for cattle and sheep, their respiratory rate is going to go from, let's say, 26 to 50 breaths per minute to 40 to 60 breaths per minute. Medium high degree of heat stress is 60 to 80 breaths per minute, say a high degree of heat stress. You're looking at 80 to 120 breaths per minute. If your cattle have more than that, say 150 breaths per minute or 200 breaths per minute for sheep, 
you are in severe heat stress and you definitely need to get on the phone to the vet. You need to take shade to that animal. Don't try to make the animal go to shade. You need to go out there with a pop-up tent and put it over top of them. They're not going to be moving around at that point anyway, so it'll probably be pretty safe for now. But again, that open mouth panting, a little bit of drooling, neck extended, if their head is up and they're breathing 120 to 160 breaths per minute, this is a threshold for concern, especially if it lasts more than two hours. If their tongue is sticking out a little bit, again, that's a sign that that animal is too hot and you need to take immediate action to help prevent the problems that come from heat exhaustion or from heat stress. What are the effects of heat stress? Why is this important? You know, okay, I get hot for a day and then I'm fine, right? It, just, it was just a hot, miserable day. Well, for a livestock, it's a little different. Like you said, like I said earlier, their heat stress begins or their heat issues begin at 68 degrees. So a really hot day for them is 80 degrees. And we're looking at 90, 100 degree heat index here. It's definitely going to be an issue. Your heat stressed cows and pigs, you're going to see gestation lengths shorten. You're going to have reduced birth weights. The young animals have compromised immunity. You'll have a drop in conception rates. You'll have a drop in fertility rates from the males. And you could also see increased fetal abnormalities and mortality. So this is a continual issue that can stick around after that hot day. So it's really important that you have some management practices ready to go for mitigating this heat stress. And number one is making sure they have unlimited, cool, fresh water. And uh, hydration is key in hot weather for humans, for animals. You have to make sure that water is available. And just like you and I, on a hot day, I am not going to have a hot cup of water. I want a nice, cold cup of water. And so it's really important to make sure that your livestock have access to cool water. If you have a running spring, awesome. You have access to cool, fresh water. But if your animals are typically drinking from a pond, that doesn't move much, that water is going to get really hot, and really nasty, and could also be carrying some diseases to your animals. So you want to try to make sure they have that fresh water available. If they're in a field where there is not a good, cool, fresh water source, tonight, after the sun goes down and it's cooling off, move them to that other paddock that has shade, and that has a good water source. Even if it's not time for that paddock to be grazed, you would rather mess up the grass on that paddock than lose a few animals in the heat. So you want to make sure that you're planning ahead and making sure these animals have access. Now, if it's really hot and you don't have the ability to move the animals to a cooler water source, you can add ice to their trough. That's going to be a lot of labor and can get expensive depending on how many animals you have. But especially if you're trying to finish off a show animal, adding some ice to your trough is going to save you a lot of stress and save your animal a lot of stress when you're trying to finish them off and make them look great for the show. The next thing after water is shade. If you have a roof that's light colored, has insulation blood, it's going to help reflect the heat. But odds are we probably are trying to get our, our roofs darker in this area so that we can keep some of the heat in for winter. However, if you're putting them in a barn, you got to make sure you're giving them a little extra space than usual and that, uh, well, I'll get more into that in a minute. So temporary shade, if they, you don't have trees around, you can put up some tarps, a shade cloth, wag, drag a wagon over there, put up a lean-to on it. Anything that you can to add a little bit additional shade that's not going to cause a hazard for the animal. Of course, there's some animals that are more curious than others. So dairy cows, goats, they're going to be more likely to tear down whatever you're putting up for them. But try to make sure that whatever you're putting out there does provide enough space for all of the livestock to fit in there without creating crowding, which is going to increase the heat. You know, we all know that when we're all crowded and pushed together, our body heat just builds and builds. So you have to give them space to lay and stretch out. And this is essential for pigs especially. You want to make sure for every pig you have that's over 100 pounds that they have six square foot of shade that, that they get to call their very own. They probably won't spread out like that, but you want to make sure you have ample space so they're not fighting and pushing out the smaller or the less aggressive animals. You want to make sure that those other animals still get the ample shade so that they can stay cool as well. 
And if you put the shade with the water source, it's going to do an additional step for you by keeping that water cool and encourage them to drink more because they're in the shade. They don't have to go out in the hot sun to get to the water. So that's going to encourage them to consume more water as well. Now, if you have a structure with solid walls, you have to make sure you have it be tall enough to allow for airflow and getting that animal heat out. You're looking at maybe 8 to 14 feet for the height of an animal enclosure that is designed to give them coolness and shade. If it's too low, it's just going to trap all that heat and humidity right around them. Make sure that they have room to move and lay down and they have shade around them. Okay, the next thing you can do is to switch up how you're feeding your animals. The digestion process itself takes energy and causes an increase in body heat. When you're feeding your animals, you're going to try to transfer 70% of their ration to the evening hours so that they're not trying to consume a big heavy meal in the middle of a hot afternoon. The rest of the ration, give them small fresh meals throughout the day so that they do eat, but they're not going to eat a whole lot during the day. You also want to try to reduce those dietary energies from their grains during periods of stress by like five to seven percent. Your fiber and roughage portions are also something you're going to want to reduce. Do keep in mind anytime you are changing your feed ration you have to do it slowly. So don't just walk out there tomorrow and take out all of the non-digestible fiber and just put in digestible fiber because your animals are going to react very poorly to that. You do not want to damage the health of the rumen for their digestion. Okay, so but reducing the fiber and the roughage is also going to reduce the body temperature because the rumen digesting those uh, non-digestible fibers will actually increase their body temperature as well. So just try to drop that down a little bit, offering some more fat content to increase the palatability and make sure that they are eating enough to maintain their gain. Also, your trace minerals, just like Commercials for the sports drink want you to know that you need when you sweat a lot, you need to replace some of those electrolytes. Well, your animals are the same way, so make sure that they have mineral salts available. Free choice. If they're loose, they'll probably consume a little more than if they're in a block. But again, making sure they have water available to mix with the minerals is really important. Okay, so inside a barn, I told you I'd get back to this one. When you're looking at a barn, your ceiling vents are going to be critical to, to exhaust rising heat out of the top of the barn. So you want to make sure that those vents are clear and unobstructed. And if you have any fans that are up in the roof that they are working properly, the ventilation fans have to be strong enough to move the air through the barn. Also, if you have a bunch of animals crowded in there and you're trying to cool them down by maybe putting some water on them, you have to be careful not to just increase the relative humidity inside that barn. You don't want to use a fogger to just spray a mist into the room because all that's going to do is increase the relative humidity. You need the fans to exchange the air, blow it over the animals, and also trying to make sure that the fans are moving in a direction that is going to help keep the whole room cool. One of the strategies that was presented by Michigan State University Extension in order to get the best air distribution throughout the entire barn, circulation fans need to be set at a 15 degree angle toward the center of the barn. To determine the right number and spacing of the fans, you're going to multiply the fan diameter times 25, and that's going to tell you how far the fans need to be apart. So the bigger the fans can be further apart. Consider the following example. If your fans are two feet in diameter, then you need to have a fan every 50 feet. If they're installed in this manner, the fans can ensure that the evaporative cooling or drying is maximized by increasing the airflow when the animals are wet. And this is especially important, like I said earlier, for pigs who do not have the ability to sweat. You also need to make sure that you have a good roof ventilation system because if you're blowing air directly on the animals in a circular motion, it's not going to be exporting any of that humidity out of the building. So you do have to make sure that that evaporation is going up through the ventilation system. Now, when you're adding water to an animal to cool them, you're going to want to make sure that you aren't, like I said, using a mist or a fog. 
you really want to just use large droplets or even a bucket or a hose. They did a study on dairy animals in 2012 where they showed that a third of a gallon of water to a cow's back every five minutes when the fans were blowing on them was very effective in reducing their heat stress. So if you do have an animal that is suffering and showing signs of heat stress, that is a good way to cool them down is that repetitive bucket of water. What you don't want to do is throw icy cold water on an animal because that's just going to send them into shock. So you don't want to put really cold water on them, but that every five minutes with a fan blowing on them can help reduce heat stress. But again, if you do witness your animal showing signs of heat stress, you do want to give the vet a call and ask about the severity and make sure that you're doing everything you can to help reduce that heat stress. If you have to move your animals very early in the morning, if you have to work them, but if you can delay any work with the animals, any treatments, any transportation or handling until these hot temperatures go away, wait till the temperature breaks and maybe even give them another day after that to recover. That's just going to create more stress. It's going to increase their body temperature, internal body temperature even more. So really, if you can avoid it, do so. If you can't avoid transporting your animals, like you've guaranteed the sale is going to be delivered at this time, try to load your animals really super early in the morning and have them at their destination by 10 a.m. That's really going to help keep them from dying on the way there. I mean, I hate to put it like that, but that's what we're looking at with these temperatures. So try to reschedule if you can. It really just isn't a great idea to take them anywhere right now, you know, unless you're moving them at night to another paddock where they have more shade and more water. I I really don't see a benefit in moving an animal right now. And especially if an animal is already showing signs of heat stress, you don't want to try to move them You can't say, here, pig, pig, come to this nice cool wallow over here. If they're laying down and they don't want to move, you have to take the wallow to them. Got to take shade to them, set it up, dump water on them, let them cool themselves down, and they'll tell you when they're ready to move. When they'll get up and they'll start moving around on their own. You don't want to force an animal who is lethargic due to heat stress to move anywhere. And pigs really, I mean, 60 degrees is where they're going to start seeing significant heat stress. So these poor, your your pigs are really, really struggling right now. So especially when it gets over 80, that's when the pigs are going to start showing significant signs of heat stress. So again, anytime you're putting water on an animal to cool them, the whole point is to get the water to evaporate. So the evaporation process actually is exothermic. So it is going to pull heat away. So as the water evaporates, the animal is going to cool. If that water doesn't have an opportunity to evaporate, it doesn't have an opportunity to cool the animal. So you do have to wait between wettings to allow the animal to dry before you you put water on them again. That way you can have the full effect of this labor that you're putting into it. Again, never apply cold water directly to an animal. Uh, We'll send them into shock. Now, I said earlier that sheep were a unique one. They're pretty comfortable over a wide range of temperatures. Remember, they have that wool coat, but wool doesn't just heat you up in the wintertime. Wool is an insulator. Whether it's hot or cold, it will insulate the animal. Now, granted, they're going to expend a little more energy if they have a full, thick, heavy wool coat, but most of you are going to shear your wool sheep before lambing, so it's probably not too much of an issue. Oh, back to pigs real quick. I just wanted to mention that your heat stress symptoms in pigs could include blotchy skin, stiffness, vocalization. If you start to see muscle tremors, the reluctance to move, you really need to get in there and help cool them down. So just to wrap everything up, if you have a heat stress emergency with your animals, provide shade to them. Take it to them. Don't try to make them go to the shade. Soak them with lukewarm to cool water, not, never cold water. Increase the airflow around them using fans if possible and provide them with cool, fresh drinking water. Minimize your handling, transportation, and any stress on these animals as much as you can and call your veterinarian for a consultation. Now, I took a lot of this information from a great publication from Washington State University Extension, and it's a great fact sheet. I do encourage you to download it, and I have put a link in the podcast extra bonus information. It's called Livestock Heat Stress Recognition, Response, and Prevention. And I do want to thank Washington State University 
Hey friends, we need your help. In order to help keep this show going, we need to hear back from you. Please take some time and check out our evaluation. Let us know if you like the show, and especially, let us know if you've used any of the information you've gained from our show. Once again, you can reach us directly. You can call Karen at 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. Or you can reach Dan at 740-695-1455. That's 740-695-1455. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.